We are very grateful for our visitors tonight. We're glad that you have come out to be with us. If you have any questions or comments about our faith and our practice and our worship here at the Roy City Church of Christ, feel free to ask us and we will appeal to the Word of God, the Bible, for an answer. The sermon that I'm going to preach tonight, I'm going to preach again on Saturday in a lectureship. So I'm kind of trying out this sermon to see how well it goes. I'll be speaking at the Maybank uh, Church of Christ, uh, one of their speakers on the lectureship that they are having. So my topic is on Awake to Righteousness. Awake to Righteousness. And if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34. This is where the title of my assigned topic comes from. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34. Paul, by inspiration, writes this, Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now let's get a context here as we are looking at this verse. We know that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth more than he wrote to any other church in the New Testament. You have 1st and 2nd Corinthians in our New Testaments written to a church that had all kinds of problems. There's nothing wrong with a church having problems. We're human, we're going to have problems. The problem comes when we don't try to fix those problems when they're pointed out. But the Lord's church at Corinth had problems that Paul had to deal with. And as he is writing to them by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, let's look at a few of the problems that Paul had to deal with. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 3, you find that there were problems over division. They were dividing over their favorite preacher. They were dividing over the ones who had baptized them. And Paul made it very clear that when you do that, you are doing something contrary to the will of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul said that we are to speak the same things, to be of the same mind, be of the same judgment. We're not to be divided, that there be no divisions among us. And so he is making it very clear that that is contrary to the will of God because Christ is not divided. Therefore, His body... The church should not be divided. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, as he deals with that subject, once again, Paul talks about their division. He says their strife, envy, and jealousy. He said, that's carnal. That's fleshly. When you divide up religiously, that is contrary to the will of God. It's definitely contrary to what Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17, when he prayed for his followers to all be one. So we see here that Paul is dealing with the problem of division within the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Also, there was sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There was a man who had his father's wife. There was sexual immorality going on within the church. And nothing was being done about it. It was tolerated. And therefore, Paul had to say, you need to take away this wicked person from among you. In other words, you are allowing sin to corrupt that congregation. And therefore, he talks about putting away that wicked person because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And therefore, you see the tolerance they had for wickedness uh, within the church there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you had lawsuits. Brethren were taking brethren to court and suing one another. And he's saying, don't you have wise men among you in which you can settle matters, settle disputes among you? We as the people of God are taking our cases before the unbelieving world. He says that should not be. Then in verses, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, you had the problem of the spiritual gifts. They had the spiritual gifts because it was through the laying on of the apostles' hands that you receive spiritual gifts, Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 19. And the people at Corinth had those spiritual gifts, but they were fighting and squabbling among them. And he says in the middle of that discussion, in that section, 
1 Corinthians 13, you need to have love for one another because the spiritual gifts are going to cease. They're not going to be in the church continually. They are temporary, and sure enough, they are. We do not have the miraculous spiritual gifts in the church today. We have what they produced, which is the Scriptures or the Word of God. But when they did exist within the first century, the speaking of tongue, the prophecy, the miracles, the supernatural knowledge that was given directly by the Holy Spirit, the people of Corinth were being carnal about it, and they were being jealous and envious concerning each other's spiritual gift. Then that brings us to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul has to deal with the subject of the resurrection from the dead. There were some in Corinth who were teaching that there is no resurrection from the dead. Perhaps they got that mindset or that concept from the Greek world. The Greeks taught that once you die, you escape from your body and you you don't want to go back to your body because you escape from your body. You're free. Your soul is free. So why would you want to return back to the prison of your body, which a resurrection is the reuniting of the spirit with an immortalized, resurrected body. And so the Greeks taught that, uh, that once you're dead, the body is no more uh, used at all. And so the concept of the resurrection was something they rejected. And some of the brethren at Corinth were actually teaching there is no resurrection from the dead. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 28... He makes the very strong case based upon historical fact that Jesus did resurrect from the dead. And that over 500 people saw Him after His resurrection from the dead on the third day. So it's a historical verified fact. And then He makes the argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He makes the fact, the factual argument... That if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not risen from the dead. And if Christ has not risen from the dead, then we have no hope. That's the logical conclusion of that false teaching. No resurrection, no Christ raised from the dead, therefore no hope. And therefore he is going to talk about this section in which we find our scripture, 1 Corinthians 15 verses uh, 29 through 34. Let's get the surrounding context here and then we can talk and zero in on awake to righteousness. Look at verse 29, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 29. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Verse 31, I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If, in the manner of men, I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. Now, let's look at these verses before it and talk just briefly about some of these things that's going on there. Verse 29 is a very controversial passage about as as concerning the meaning of it. Paul says, otherwise, talking about if there is no resurrection from the dead, as these false teachers were saying, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not raise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? Some think that you read from, that this is referring to there was a group that was actually baptizing for those who were dead. Uh, I don't think that that's exactly what Paul is dealing dealing with here. I believe that it's referring to in view of death. In view of death, why are you being baptized? If there is no resurrection from the dead, why are you being baptized for the dead? So I believe that that is the meaning there. We don't want to get bogged down in verse 29 because that's not our topic. The point is, this is meaningless if there is no resurrection from the dead. Also, verse 30. Why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Talking about the persecution they were facing. They were going around around preaching, Jesus is risen from the dead. He says, this is meaningless if there is no resurrection from the dead. 
He says in verse 31, I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ, I die daily. That means Paul was facing persecution and the end of his life on a daily basis because it was very dangerous to be a Christian in the first century. You had that danger on him all the time. And therefore he is saying, I die daily. He talks about some of that in verse 32. He says, in the matter of men, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. Now some have wondered, is this literally talking about physical beasts? As they would take Christians and put them in the arena and let them fight beasts as their entertainment. Or was he talking uh, symbolically? Uh, we probably will never know the meaning of that. The point is very clear. He was in danger. He was in danger and he was saying there in verse 32, I fought with beast at Ephesus and what advantage is that to me if there is no resurrection from the dead? If the dead do not rise, he says in verse 32, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. This is the concluding conclusion of that false teaching. If there is no rising from the dead after a person dies, there is no hope. And basically saying everything that we're doing in Christianity is a waste of time. That's the point. And he said, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then we should adopt the Epicurean philosophy, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. We should just do whatever we want to do because when we die, it's all over. It's like turning off a light switch. That is the end result of that false doctrine. Now, let's look at verse 33 and 34. Do not be deceived. And that's the point he's trying to get across. Don't be deceived. This is deceiving you. This is causing you to believe something that's contrary to the truth. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now let me read this to you from the English Standard Version. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. And what he's talking about there, he's talking about these false teachers who are having an influence on the brethren there, who are saying there is no resurrection from the dead, that being the case, as he said, there's really no point to our life if there is no resurrection. They're having a corrupting influence on you. Bad company ruins good morals. So he says in verse 34, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34, Awake to righteousness and do not sin. The English Standard Version brings out what the original Greek is saying. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. What he's saying is, there is you've got to wake up. You've been intoxicated. You've been influenced. You've gotten sleepy, symbolically speaking, concerning these false teachers. And as a result of that, you've got to wake up. Do we not tell people from time to time, teachers in the audience, do we not say to our students who are awake physically, but mentally you see that glare on their face, do you not say, wake up? Oh, they're awake physically, but they're not paying attention. And that's exactly what's happening to the brethren at Corinth. He's saying, you've got to wake up from your drunken stupor. Awake to righteousness. Do what is right. And do not go on sinning. Do not sin. That's what it's referring to in verse 34. These false teachers are causing you to sin. They're causing you to do things that's contrary to the will of God. He says, you do not have the knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Hosea 4 and verse 6, God says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And that's the problem. And that's how false teachers can deceive people and cause people to be drunken or asleep, spiritually speaking. So he's telling us to awake to righteousness. Let's look at a few points concerning this subject and then the lesson will be yours. Number one. The point that we need to take from this very clearly is, number one, we need to wake up. 
We need to wake up. <coughs> Paul talks about this in other verses. Ephesians chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. We need to wake up from our sleep because sleeping when we should be awake can be dangerous. How many people every year are killed on the road because they fall asleep behind the wheel? Truckers, drivers, long distance. They fall asleep behind the wheel and then they wreck, they hurt themselves severely or they kill someone else. And because of that, tragedy strikes. And spiritually speaking, if we do not wake up, tragedy will strike us, something that's very worse than a physical accident in a car. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14, Paul says this, And do this knowing the time that now is a high time, now it is the high time, to awake out of sleep. For now salvation is nearer than, it, uh, than when it, you first believed. Verse 12, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Verse 14, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Paul is saying here in this context, we've got to wake up and we've got to get busy. How many times have soldiers, soldiers in the field throughout history caused their enemies to win a victory because they were asleep? Because they were asleep at their post. They were not paying attention. And this is exactly what he's saying. It's high time to awake out of our sleep. We've got to put off the works of darkness of the flesh and put on the armor of light. We've got to live as God wants us to live. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Again, we see Paul using this same language about waking up spiritually. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 through 14 Paul says, beginning in verse 11, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Look at verse 14, Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Christ said, I am the light of the world. I will give you light. I will give you direction. But you've got to wake up from your spiritual slumber. And you have to benefit from the light that I am giving you. He starts off that section by saying in verse 11, we are to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That means joint participation with the things of this world. We're to rather expose them. We're to point out what those things are that are contrary to the will of God. We've got to expose them. So number one, we have to realize very clearly that we need to wake up. There is a definite, definite need for us to awaken from our spiritual slumber. And churches of Christ are asleep. So many areas, they are just sound asleep. There might be some here physically asleep. But I'm talking about spiritually asleep. Who are not paying attention to what's going on. There's elders who are asleep concerning what's being preached from the pulpit. There are members who are asleep concerning the things that are going on. And they need to look into God's word, which is light. Psalm 119, verse 105. And see what is actually happening. We need to wake up. Number two. We need to awake to the necessity of holiness. We need to awake to the necessity of holiness. Remember what was said in 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 34. Awake to righteousness and do not continue sinning. We're not just to wake up and to continue in our sin. We've got to awake to the necessity of holiness. 
It is necessary for us to be holy. And let me briefly explain what holiness is. It's very simple. You're cleaning your house. You come across some things, and you know you got piles of stuff everywhere like we do. You know you do. you got the piles of stuff that you're cleaning up, and you're going through your piles, and you find the things that are valuable to you, you put them aside. That's holiness. That's sanctification. You've sanctified those items to keep. The rest of it, you throw in the garbage. That's holiness, being set apart. And therefore, we've got to awake to the necessity of holiness. John chapter 15, verses 18 through 19, this is something that churches of Christ and Christians have got to realize that we're not going to fit into this world. In fact, if we're preaching and practicing the truth as we should, the world is going to hate us. John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You know the world hates the real Jesus of the Bible? Not the fictitious, mythical Jesus presented in the denominational world. Not that. The actual Jesus that we find in the pages of the Bible. The world hates that Jesus. And Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that they hated me before it hated you. Verse 19, if you were of the world, he says, the world would love its own. If you belong to them, the world would love you. Yet because you are not of the world, I chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. In other words, you have been chosen out of the world. That's holiness. In other words, you are to be the ecclesia, the church. Matthew 16 and verse 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, my people that have been called out of the world into a proper relationship with God. And therefore, when we live as we ought, and we shine as we ought to shine, not everyone's going to appreciate it. Not everyone is going to love us for it. But we have to awake to the necessity of holiness. If we were of the world... The world's not going to give us any problems. And that's the problem. That worldliness is coming into the churches of Christ in so many areas. And therefore the world has no problem with them. We've got to awake to the necessity of holiness. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse... Uh, 16 through chapter 7 and verse 1, all that context goes together. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, Paul says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as He has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. You're the temple of the living God. What, what uh, agreement or fellowship do you have with false religion? With idols, the answer is none. Verse 17, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7 and verse 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and of the Spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If we wish to be the people God wants us to be, His sons, His daughters, we've got to come out from among them and be separate. That doesn't mean we build a compound and build a fence around it with barbed wire. But it means that when we're in the world, we don't act like the world. We're distinct from the world. They can see clearly that we are a follower of Jesus Christ by our actions, by our reactions, by what we say, what we do. They can see that very clearly. So, chapter 7 and verse 1 of 2 Corinthians makes it very clear that we perfect holiness in the fear of God when we cleanse ourselves from the filth of the flesh and of the Spirit. Fearing God is the key. That is respect and reverence for His Word. And that's where so many brethren have gone astray. They don't fear God anymore. If they feared Him as they ought, they would not dare twist or distort or tamper with or add to the will of God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Paul says this concerning our dedication to God. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to the world. And that imagery there is being pressed into the mold of the world. There are pressures upon us from the world for us to be like them. Peer pressure. It's not just for young people. It's for all ages. It's for all those who wish to do what's right. Peer pressure for us to conform. But we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind with our hearts set on doing what the Lord wants. James chapter 1 and verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That word visit means to take care of. You go and see the needs and you take care of them. Therefore, pure and undefiled religion before God is this. You take care of those who are in need and you keep yourself pure. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. That is what we have to awake unto. We have to awake unto holiness. James 4 and verse 4, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And you don't want to be an enemy of God. Read the Old Testament. You will see what will happen if you dare oppose God. If you dare set yourself as an opponent of His. You will lose every time. That's exactly what the book of Revelation is all about. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Peter says, But as He who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. That's language from the book of Leviticus. You be holy, you be set apart, you be my people set apart. God says, as I am holy, I am set apart, I am distinct, I am different. Then the famous passage of 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17. Listen to the words of the Apostle John. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. You see, this is how the devil has always worked. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. He's always operated that way. and He's operating that way today to get us to be his people and to pull us away. But we have to awake to the fact that there is holiness that we must maintain if we wish to be pleasing in the eyes of God. Finally, third, we need to awake to sound doctrine. And this goes along with it. We need to awake to sound doctrine. Sound means healthy. That which is right. That which is correct. Doctrine means teaching. Correct teaching. We've got to awake to correct teaching. Because if we don't have correct teaching, we will not be living correctly. Did we not see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Evil companions corrupt good morals. These evil companions who are teaching this false doctrine about there is no resurrection leads to the concept, let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. There's no point in life. Let's just do whatever we want to do. False doctrine leads to immorality. It always does. So we need to awake to true teaching or sound doctrine. And that's found throughout the pages of the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. As Paul is talking to Timothy, some of the last words he would write by inspiration before he's killed. He writes and gives that solemn charge to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 2 to preach the word, to be instant in season and out of season. I mean, you preach it all the time. You preach it when it's popular. You preach it when it's not. 
You preach the Word of God always. You don't ever compromise. And he says in verses 3 through 5 of 2 Timothy chapter 4, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables but you be watchful in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry he's saying you preach the word you be instant in season and out you preach it consistently when it's popular when it's not because there's coming a time when they don't want to hear it anymore And they're going to turn their ears away from hearing true gospel preaching, true preaching that is the whole counsel of God. They're going to turn away from that to listen to false teachers that's going to allow them to remain in their sin. He says, you be watchful to that. They're going to turn their ears away from the truth and be turned into fables. Is it not interesting that the most popular preaching in the world is storytelling? Fables? Is that not the type of books that sell in the religious bookstores? Storytelling? Fables? Not to mention the false doctrine that's in there. Turning people aside from the truth unto fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We've got to awake to sound doctrine. Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. This is a charge to elders. If elders would take this charge seriously, false teachers that come into the pulpit would not get an audience. Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul tells the elders, Titus 1 and verse 9, Hold fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Elders of the church have got to have the ability to recognize false teaching and to point it out and not allow it to affect their members. Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. Here's what Paul tells Titus, another gospel preacher. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. Listen to this. This is how important doctrine is. The popular concept today is it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you believe. We all have different opinions on things, they say. But here's how important correct doctrine is. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing so, this will save both you and those who hear you. My salvation is based upon continuing in the correct doctrine. Your salvation is depending on remaining in the correct doctrine. That's how serious it is. And when those come to us who do teach error, we have a responsibility not to give them an audience. We have a responsibility to point them out for the false teachers that they are. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. Notice what Paul says as as he ends that great letter. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by their smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. We have got to avoid them. We've got to note. That means to look intently upon. We have to know who's teaching error so that they will be avoided. 2 John verses 9 through 11. We'll look at this and the lesson will be yours. When they come to us not bringing the truth, we should not allow them to have an audience. 2 John verses 9-11 through Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ 
does not have God. Again, that shows how important the truth is. If a person does not abide in the teaching of Jesus Christ on any subject, whether it be baptism, whether it be marriage, divorce, and remarriage, whether it be the worship of the church, on any subject, they do not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. Churches met in houses in the first century. He's saying you don't let that false teacher come in there and teach his false doctrine. Verse 11, For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. And that greeting there refers to encouraging that person in what they're teaching. Awake to righteousness. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34. Do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. We have got to wake up, brethren. We have got to wake up individually as Christians and collectively as the church. We've got to wake up to holiness. We've got to wake up to proper teaching. And we have to wake up to knowing the will of God. Hosea 4 and verse 6, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Let us not fall into that category. Let us wake up to righteousness, doing what's right in the sight of God. Perhaps there's someone here tonight that wants to become a Christian. You want to obey the Lord. We're going to tell you what the Bible says on that. Jesus said in John 3 and verse 5, If you're born of water and the Spirit, you'll enter the kingdom of heaven. He said in Mark 16 and verse 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. The Holy Spirit said through Peter in Acts 2 and verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you believe in Christ, you make that confession, you repent of your sins, you can be baptized, immersed in water, for the forgiveness of your sins, so the blood of Christ can take away your sins. And the Lord will add you to His church. Acts 2 and verse 47. If you've done that, you've gone astray. You're asleep, spiritually speaking. Wake up. Repent. Come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and sing.